So basically, the theme of our discussion today was social entrepreneurship and leadership. And uh, what we do is uh, we do a career planning for students in India and been working from last five years uh, talking about various opportunities which student has to face and make sure that he's not deprived about the opportunity. And we've been doing this uh, with uh, collaborations with policymakers, members of parliament, and reaching out to half a million students every year. So the whole idea of social entrepreneurship is uh, you need to identify a large problem. Because if you want to identify a large problem, you will actually then think of its revenue model and all the other aspects. If you identify a very small problem, you actually end up solving the problem very quickly, and then there's no time for the revenue model or so on. So to quickly brief you what actually, uh, how we are thinking of the leadership, is I'll share you a small story. Once upon a time, uh, there was a conference to uh, see that these are world's best drunkards sitting in front of them. And uh, a doctor is told that in front of you, there are world's best alcoholic drinkers sitting, and you have to make them ensure that drinking alcohol is dangerous to their health. So doctor does an experiment. He takes a mineral water bottle, puts an earthworm into it. The earthworm jumps and comes out. And he takes another alcohol bottle. He puts an earthworm into it. The earthworm disintegrates and dies. And then he says, gentlemen, what do you understand by this? And one drunker gets up and says, if you drink alcohol, there will be no earthworms in your stomach. <laughs> so, in order to make sure that you have to solve the problem out of the box, in order to think that passion, in order to have that leadership and leader shift, both the skills are required to take the social entrepreneurship further. What I also see and visualize is the problem in our sector is such huge that you need to identify what kind of team you are working with. And as you all know, together everyone achieves more. So if you have a problem along with the team to solve that, it actually replicates and implements a larger solution to make it happen. So when we started doing career planning with the students, we realized that in India, uh, if you get less talk time on your mobile, if you recharge for maybe 100 rupees, you go and fight out to the customer service and ask, why did my talk time was less? But in a similar way, if you get less education, we don't go and fight out saying, oh, I invested so much, but I didn't get the enough talk time which I was supposed to get. The moment we start having the career planning, career doctor process, we'll be able to make this more larger problem solved. So that's what we were trying to do it. So, According to me, I think the four qualities which social entrepreneurs need, one is passion. Passion as a poison which makes you think every day is the last day of yours and you're going to solve that problem today itself. The second one is, of course, you need to have leadership as well as leadership. So the next generation takes up once you, once you finish trying to solve the problem at a certain level. And then third one, most importantly, thinking outside the box. So you need to identify a problem and give a solution which is outside the box. So I think that's how I will wrap up. Thank you. Uh, hi, I'm Min. Uh, I'm not really much of a social entrepreneur, but an entrepreneur. So I don't think it's very fair for me to uh, come up with leadership qualities and all that for social entrepreneurs. But uh, I would like to put my attention on the role that education can play to inspire and to develop uh, successful entrepreneur, uh, entrepreneurial uh, ventures. Uh, I think, of course, there are certain basic uh, infrastructure elements that we need in order to have a successful uh, entrepreneurship uh, economy. So examples like uh, access to capital, uh, market-based economy and um, what else? Uh, being able to uh, finance and uh, ownership to, uh, right to ownership of private pro uh, property and et cetera. So, but besides that, I would also uh, like to emphasize on the role of education. Because education to me can inspire entrepreneurship. So by that, uh, what I mean is entrepreneurs are optimists. But we're not blind optimists. So when I uh, decided to become an entrepreneur, there, there, was, there was a lot of risks and costs involved. Uh, 
so even though if you, you can raise uh, your, the money from venture capital, there's opportunity cost because you have to quit your job and you have to take on that, that uh, innovation that you want to do. So there's a lot of cost and risk involved in taking up entrepreneurship. But it's not blind optimism that drove me to do it. It's, I had to understand the macroeconomic uh, situation of the country, of the market. I had to understand the political risks that were involved. And I had to understand how society would um, react to my product and service. So there is a lot of uh, calculated optimism involved in entrepreneurship. Another thing is education is crucial to help execute this uh, entrepreneurial venture because the economy is becoming very complex. The markets are becoming very complex. And in order, even if you have a really good product, you need other skill sets like um, public relations. You need to have a good uh, HR skill. You need to be able to set up a system in your organization that is efficient. And I think, and you know, I'm not saying that only education can help uh, equip us with these skills, but I think we definitely need uh, to a certain level and exposure to a certain level of education in order to uh, be inspired, to take up entrepreneurship, and in order to execute your innovations uh, effectively and to have an, a successful, sustainable um, entrepreneurial venture. So that's it. Okay. Can I have the presentation on, please? Okay, so uh, I've got a very, very difficult task to do. Uh, mission to change the world, and I got less than five minutes. Uh, my co-speakers saved a minute each, so I'm not challenging them on that. But uh, I'm just trying to take you through a very quick journey of you know my own life. Last couple of years, there were a lot of our younger colleagues asking me yesterday, "How did you get into the government? You know, you did a BTEC and MBA, and what happened?" And uh, so I thought I'll you know take it quickly uh, since I have less time. Uh, put in part of the story in the PowerPoint. And then just one key lesson that I've learned uh, in all these last seven, eight years, which is the power of IT. OK, and so uh, I did my BTEC from uh, Dhirubhai Mani Institute. This is in Gandhinagar, Gujarat. One year down the BTEC, I figured out that I don't want to be a software engineer, which is what the course is all about. So I tried exploring other things while I was sort of trying to study and uh, got into biology and ICT, which inspired me. Uh, ended up in a, in a stem cell research lab in my second year internship. Uh, tried dabbling something there. Ended up in University of Cambridge for an internship at the zoology department, you know, trying to figure out how information and communication works in the fly of an eye. And after that, I got so excited by bio and ICT that I wanted to do a PhD. Came back to India. Uh, luckily missed my first round of placements at the college and also dropped the PhD idea. And then I was there last year of college, you know, not sure what exactly to do. And uh, that's how a lot, of a lot of guys turn into social entrepreneurs, by the way. Uh, that's a lesson. And then I thought, OK, you know, got enough managerial stuff, got some IT background, uh, let's go social. So lined up at the IIT Madras uh, incubator with Professor Junjunwala, tried uh, doing a rural BPO company, uh, was very, very excited by the idea. A friend of mine and I were both together onto it. We worked 18 hours a day, slept in office, you know, uh, you know how social entrepreneurs or any other entrepreneur works. And in four months, you know, I was going through something, uh, something which I couldn't understand. I somehow didn't like working at all, and this was like my favorite idea. Uh, I don't know what happened, but uh, then I figured out the jargon was that I was going through a burnout. Uh, anyways, took some time to come out of the burnout, and uh, then uh, sort of started working again, but then came off uh, for my MBA at the Satyasai University in Puttaparthi, and uh, that was a life-changing experience. Two awesome years there, doing my uh, master's. 
uh, got exposed to human values, to spirituality, to a different world altogether and uh, how do you look at life differently. Did that, came back to Delhi, didn't want to get into a corporate and I was just looking around, uh, probably an NGO, probably a startup again and uh, didn't have government on my mind but uh, got lucky, happened. Uh, joined the National Knowledge Commission, which was an advisory body to the Prime Minister, worked with uh, Mr. Sam Petroda and uh, Nandan Nilikani and a lot of others. Uh, again decided, this is an interesting proposition, we can change the world sitting here, you know, very important office, a lot of enthusiasm, a lot of energy, the right place. So try changing the world again and eight months down the line, burn out again. So, So then realized that why is this happening again and again? And I figured out, you know, this was IT. I mean, there's a lot of introspection, there was a lot of talking to my professors at the Satasai University. There was a lot of other things. But IT was missing. IT is what drives social transformation. Anybody who disagrees, very quick raise of hands. Yeah? So IT is the key in life, you know. And I've heard a lot of panelists in the morning discussing this, and um, I'm sure you have you know, got the message now, so I don't need to spend a lot of time. But I thought some of you would disagree, and I meant a little different IT. I meant inner transformation. So I was at the right place. I had passion, had the knowledge skills, some bit of clarity, got interesting mentors like Sam and others, enough family support and financial support. Went wrong once, burn out twice, going on again and again, and when I figured this eye out, that it is inner transformation which really drives social transformation. So no point just going out driving social transformation without your own inner transformation. Then I started working on it. And Tolstoy says, everyone thinks of changing the world, but no one thinks of changing himself. So that is the key message which I want to give out. And I've got exactly zero seconds left. I quickly go through the next few slides in the next 30 seconds. Inner transformation is really about getting to know yourself, you know. So when you understand yourself better, you can understand others better. And there were some people who were echoing the same thought this morning and yesterday. You get to understand the problems, the way you want to communicate, the strategy, and you know all the cool stuff and the tools we talked about. You get to know better once you know yourself better. Inner transformation, you know, a lot of stuff. You've got to understand, everybody's saying be selfless, selfless. You've got to understand why be selfless and what does it mean to be selfless? What does it mean to do sacrifice? You know, what does it mean to stay in silence and how does it all connect? So the key bottom line is the internet first and then the internet and other stuff. This is something which I got from the internet. Uh, I am not sure if Gandhi said all of that, but I just want to draw your attention to the first and the last line. Change yourself, you're in control, grow and evolve. The journey obviously starts with little steps. The first step is to breathe. I wanted to do something here, but we don't have the time, so anyway, I'll move on. Uh, some starting steps, you know, connecting with yourself, creating and recreating your definition of success, as in when you evolve, you'll have newer definitions of success. Watch is a very interesting transformation tool for leadership, you know, basically, Put it on your diary, watch your words, actions, thoughts, character and heart. Do an introspection every day on, on what you're thinking, what your actions are, where you're going. And lastly, I want to suggest one, one of the best books I've ever read on leadership, management, social entrepreneurship, which I'm still reading, I haven't got all of it, is the Bhagavad Gita. You know, it's not necessarily taken as Hindu. I believe it's, it's one of the best management guides. And especially by Eknath Ishwaran and by Swami Ranganathananji. Uh, the Bhagavad Gita is basically the story of this guy Arjun, you know, who was in the battlefield and, you know, facing a leadership crisis there, was in his moment and uh, had all of these confusions and uh, Krishna sorted it out for him. So, that's the final message. <laughs> Thank you. So, I... So I know everybody um, is extremely hungry and I'll, I'll respect that. I'll try to keep it to four minutes. I had five points and, and I'll try to cut them down to one. Um, I think in order to, to speak about um, social innovation and what a social entrepreneur needs, what, what leadership um, qualities, um, I wrote my thesis a couple of years ago at the Harvard Kennedy School about social innovation. Um, and while writing it, I really grappled with with thought, what is a social innovator? I read five to six books and I, and I 
read 50 different definitions. And in the end, the one that, that struck me most was the one by Peter Drucker, which says that the purposeful innovation describes it as a novel solution to a social problem that is more effective, efficient, and sustainable than existing solutions, and for which the value created occurs primarily to society as a whole rather than private individuals. To be considered an innovation, a process or outcome must meet two criteria. The first is novelty. Although innovations need not necessarily to be original, they must be new to the user, context, or application. The second criteria is improvement. To be considered an innovation, a process or outcome must be either more effective or more efficient than pre-existing alternatives and sustainable. And I chose uh, that broad definition of, of Peter Drucker because I really think that the field of social innovation is changing. And uh, Mr. Kimka spoke about it yesterday, but we're living in a global world. We're living in a, in a cross-disciplinary world where we have a lot, of, a lot of powerful networks that we need to, that we need to use. And if I leave you with, with one point, um, I think it's really important to recognize the role of the really cross-sector dynamics. A social innovator must be willing to cross disciplinaries, cross boundaries, and really leap towards the sky. Because today, with technology and all the things we have in our, disposable, in our disposal, there's really ways to do that. We need to shift the rules, shift the relationships, take all we have in our power, and bring it to another, to another level. A lot of people have great ideas, but an, an idea does not make you a successful social innovator, successful social entrepreneur. What will make you a successful social entrepreneur is using all your networks, bridging them together, being a, kind of a social, social alchemist, really, in a way. Um, and in order to bring together the ideas, experiences, skills, and resources, and only then something new can really come out of it. And I think really you should take the networks that you have. The, the, the TGLF network is a wonderful and remarkable network. You're all here, but, but really take, take advantage, take advantage of it because it can really take you to, 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 new, to new highs. And I think a very interesting um, article that I read uh, a few years back was a uh, Grand Zometer wrote about it, about the strength of weak ties. And the strength of weak ties talks about how in your, in your strategic networks and the people that you, that you acquire along the way and the people that you have in your network really get you most of your jobs, really advance you in, the, in, your, in your world, especially today in a global world that, that, we, that we're a part of. So I think really take, take, it, take it as that. I know for me, I'm a part of like five different five, ten different networks. I'm part of the, the World Economic Global Shapers. I'm part of the ROI community, which is a part of the Schusterman Foundation. Uh, we have the, you know, the, the Harvard Alumni Network. There's a lot of different networks. And only by using them all, and when I, when I co-founded uh, um, my first social venture called Contribute, one of, the, one of the things that I used was really all the networks. And I think without those networks, I would have not succeeded in putting the idea forward. Because an idea is one thing, but taking it to the next level, you need to really use all the powers that you have. So keep it global, use your networks, and with that, we'll all go to lunch, I guess. <laughs> now we we'll just quickly play the role of the moderator. Uh, uh, thank you, everybody, for the patient uh, hearing. I'm sure there are no, no questions. I just have one question. <laughs> Which way out for lunch? That's it, thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, a huge round of applause for all our panelists.